The NBA is starting to heat up. Big plays, big wins, and a shot at even bigger cash prizes. So why not get in on the action? We've teamed up with DraftKings, who have a brand new way to play daily fantasy sports with Pick 6. Right now, all new customers get $50 in Pick 6 credits after playing $5 in their first pick set. Track your lineup and compete against others for a chance at huge cash prizes. Getting started is simple. Download the DraftKings Pick 6 app and sign up using code SMOKE. New customers can get $50 in Pick 6 credits when they play just $5. That's code SMOKE only at DraftKings Pick 6. The crown is yours. We really have a lot going on between starting our own business, spending time with family, and working. Sometimes it's hard to just find time to chill and celebrate the win. That's why Coors Light helps me find time to reset and refresh all year long. I feel you, Matt. Anytime I'm trying to chill and watch the games with the crew, I crack open a cold Coors Light. It's the only beer out there that's made to chill. You can't beat that, and you always need that time to unwind. And Coors Light helps embrace it. So when it's time to chill... Coors Light is the beer I'm definitely reaching for. Coors Light is the perfect refreshment. It's cold lagered, cold filtered, and cold packaged. And it's easy and convenient to get Coors Light delivered straight to your door. Just head to Drizzly or Instacart by going to CoorsLight.com slash smoke. That's right. Head to CoorsLight.com slash smoke. Celebrate responsibly. Coors Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado. You shouldn't have to worry when you buy tickets to your next big event. Game time is a fast and easy way to buy all your tickets to the events near you with last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat and the best price guaranteed. From a Laker game to Ice Cube concerts. I know game time is going to hook up with the last minute tickets and the lowest prices guaranteed. That's right. Game time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. You can even see the view of your seat before you buy so you can know exactly what to expect. And the game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create your account, and use promo code SMOKE for $20 off your first purchase. That's code SMOKE for $20 off. Download the game time app. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. Welcome back, All the Smoke, New York. Um, I'm just enamored. Is, is that a good word? I can't spell it, but I, I agree with you. Because I love, I've only seen snow fall like five times in my life, and it's literally falling right now, so I, I, th- I think it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Bang, right. Man, we're here in New York City, um, and I'm excited about this one. This guy right here is someone who I, you know, watched for a long time on television and just admired what he stood for. And it's a rarity, you know, when you kind of work for a machine to really be able to stand on what you believe in, and this guy did that. Um, and then he also took another chance on, on, on wanting to team up with me and you, yep. which, is, which is dope. So um, welcome to the show, Dan Lebetard. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, thank you, guys. Yes. I, uh, I have trouble generally. Oh, he's already working on his coffee. <laughs> he's already working on his slightly racist but notarized and endorsed by me. He said he's going to get good at this impersonation of my father, uh, uh, Stephen Jackson. Uh, Stephen yeah. Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> and, and 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 Dan's got his ankles out too, which I love. I'm normally an ankle abuser myself, but he's got his ankles out today. It's, it's gonna be no, it's gonna be a good day. I, I have trouble with style. I'm sorry. No, I like I it. Fresh Nikes. You ask them. I have ankles out all of them. My suits, yes. everything. It just was cold here, so I kept mine in. But um, man, let's get to it. Your transition from ESPN. Um, you know, obviously that's where everyone kind of get got a chance to get to know you. Um, your transition from ESPN to Meadowlark. Can we talk about that? The ending there and the beginning of something which is amazing with yourself and Bimmel and, and John Skipper. Uh, yeah, before we do that, though, I'd just like your audience to know uh, how deeply appreciative I am of you guys and admire how it is you did what you did beyond, you know, a decade and a half each in the league working through a bunch of competitive ecosystems in a sport where the inner cities are fighting for money the idea that you guys would have so many teammates who would love you and know that you had their back at every turn the idea that you are consummate friends not just with each other but that your teammates always know that you are somebody who can be counted on and that you did it 
your way every step of the way and are still doing it your way. I don't do thrilled a lot, but I am thrilled to be in business with you guys. I am thrilled that you guys who have had all sorts of business opportunities coming your way for 25 years that you would trust us with your future because I believe we've got a giant one ahead uh, because we've all seen the market inefficiencies of you can build your own brand now. You can work outside the machine. You can be legitimately free to be an independent thinker, to say what you want because you're your own boss. Like you can, and you can form your own teams. Like you can be your own boss and form your own team. So like we are kindred spirits in this space. And I believe like together we're going to do big things that inspire us and other people. So yeah, I leave ESPN and they forced upon me self-employment and I don't know that I would have chosen it from the safety of the machine. It would be easy to stay there and just keep cashing checks. But some of the things that happened were uncomfortable enough that I felt pushed into something and it's been a successful business venture because in order to get out of there without making a mess that was loud with headlines, they gave us all our stuff. They gave us all our intellectual property to just don't cause Disney headlines talking about all the stuff you've been talking about. Just leave and take your stuff. And so we packed up our stuff and went and it's been something that is wildly fulfilling as all things that are difficult must be. Like, all, all, if you're going to accomplish something that feels fulfilling, it almost has to be difficult. You have to choose the hard path. When you're exiting ESPN, is, is Meadowlark already brewing? Is it not even a thought? Like, what is your thought process? I almost seem like it, it, it seems like that, <clears throat> you know, the transition from NBA to what was next for us, it almost seems like that's what that was for you. I don't do a lot in the way of regret, but one of the things that I would say that I do regret is not planning a little less emotionally my exit on their dime, the way Stephen A. Smith is doing it now on first take, where across the scroll on the bottom you see, and go check out the Stephen A. Smith show over here that has nothing to do with ESPN, right. where he's saying the things he won't say on ESPN to build his brand outside of ESPN. I did it more emotionally. I'm like, okay, you're gonna make me do this myself? All right, fuck it, we'll do it, we'll do it ourselves. And, and because they fired, they let go of one of my guys. My mentor's son was fired off our show without telling me, and that was sort of the last straw after, you know, inhibiting freedoms and stuff. That was the last straw. And so I wish I'd been slightly less emotional because I had about a year and a half that I could have done it on their dime. On their dime. Yeah. But like I said, the forcing me to do it has made me like speed up the curve on what I have to learn about business so that you guys can now see the, the business gorillas I've got and you guys can learn from them and we can make all the things we want to make. Yeah, I mean, in, in our situation, too, was we kind of saw it coming, you know, obviously with the Paramount situation and Showtime and, and, and kind of working and, and seeing, OK, what was next? You know, it's been a, a tremendous opportunity with Showtime to partner, learn, get the build our brand. And when it was time to make a move, similar stuff. I mean, they, they didn't push us out by any means, but, you know, the, the, the sign was on the wall, the writing was on the wall, it was coming to an end. But in that meantime, we had already started building our production company. And luckily for us, you know, Paramount and Showtime and shout out Steven Espinosa, they found a way for us to get all of our intellectual property, all of our archives. And it was almost like a good luck situation. So when we left, we got lucky and landed right on our feet because we had already started building this company and then you know two months after we're up and running we get news that we're gonna have the opportunity to team up with you guys and pick your brain and and learn and utilize your ecosystem and feel like we can bring some you know some credible and and, and good stuff your guys's way too so i mean again we talked about this all night at dinner last night we won't bore you guys with that conversation but it was a good conversation really it wouldn't have been excited. boring close the restaurant <laughs> right? close the restaurant <laughs> yeah <laughs> for real, for real. So to those who don't know, what is what is Metal Lark and, and, and who are your, your your teams? And, you know, obviously John Skipper, former ESPN president, Bimmel, someone who was over at ESPN. So who are they and, and, and what is Metal Lark about? Yeah, we've got Deidre who leads our documentary division. And uh, what we are is uh, storytellers in the media business who are looking to evolve in the new media world. Um, you know, we are a company that has a, a giant audio product that is now growing in the video space. I've had to, we've had to do all of that. You guys have learned what it takes. Content business is expensive. Like you, and especially if you're gonna do video like this, you have to, you have, to have people in order to do that. And so we've got a, 
almost 20 documentaries that are going to be sold in the next uh, two years because John Skipper was the most powerful man in sports when he was at ESPN. Like, he knows how to do this. He, he did the 30 for 30 series. So you guys see that Hollywood has been crumbling or stagnant or atrophying or, or unstable for two years, and we're going to have 20 documentaries in the next few years. And I know you guys got a 1,000 ideas. Mm -hmm. you got a 1,000 connections. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to be a company that builds out this arm over here. I'm the side of the company where we do this stuff, you know, interviews, intimacies, vulnerabilities, laughter, get to know these people for real. I can't wait. Like, I know they've seen some of Steven Jackson here, but his dark comedy thespian, I don't <laughs> think the world comedy. is ready. I do not think the world is ready for how funny this person actually is, uh, even though shit. he can kick your ass and everyone knows uh, he can kick your ass. I don't funny. know that they know how funny he is. <laughs> And so hopefully we'll have some unscripted work for him to do because I believe there are a lot of Hollywood roles for this man if he chooses them. Indeed, indeed. I asked you, <laughs> I asked you and, and, and a Rachel a question last night um, and it was interesting because I literally got- We should mention her too, by the way, yeah, because definitely. Shout like out Rachel. just a, a, a yeah. true gangster who's gonna help us a lot yeah, here. Yes. I mean, Rachel Nichols is obviously very instrumental um, and Jack and I start in media and I was telling a story last night that when we had Rachel on, was it a year and a half ago? Last season? I got a call from one of the bosses at ESPN like right after it aired, like, hey, how come you didn't tell us you were gonna have Rachel? I'm just like, um, I didn't think I had to tell you that I was gonna have Rachel, you know what I mean? And it was, and I, I, at that moment, you know, and I told her last night for the first time, I think, and, and, and the, the crew knew, I was like, you know, obviously I still, I hadn't had no issues with ESPN up to that point. And I really didn't even have no issues with my exit. But up to that point, I was just like, you know, we gotta be careful because, that's just the machine. But like the more and more I thought about it and the more and more we were talking, we were hearing her story, I was willing to lose my job at ESPN to allow Rachel to have a platform to tell her truth on. Cause I don't feel like she had an opportunity to tell her truth. It was the machine's word. And then Rachel, you're silenced. You can't say anything. So I just thought that was extremely unfair. Uh, I hated the narrative that was painted with, uh, with her because we know who she is and what she stands for. And the narrative that was painted by the bigger machine was couldn't be further from the truth so us i feel like us allowing her to kind of speak her truths on our platform and then kind of get her back you know kind of be a, a stepping stone to get her back in this space i mean she's probably the most trusted nba reporter in the game everybody loves her and respects her and, and she does great work so again to definitely shout out rachel and that was one of the first things when jelani and i came out with you 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 know you spoke highly on her and and, and how much respect and, and and love you guys have for each other so Definitely throwing her in the mix only is going to help. But when you talk about the machine, right, and you guys can both sort of speak to this uniquely because you've navigated the labyrinth so well, the machine makes you or can make you with its pressures dilute your authenticity by degrees by requesting compromises from you at every turn and choices like that where what an impossible spot for the two of you. You know Rachel Nichols. You know everything she's about. And now you're put in the spot where a, a white woman has lost her job in the climate of after George Floyd and Disney doesn't know how to react mm -hmm. and there's corporate pressure and American pressure. And now you two are put in the spot where you're defending Rachel Nichols and against. it sounds like you might be against black women or can be perceived against black women. A difficult spot for you guys to choose. No, we're going to be authentic. And this mm -hmm. is one of the many reasons I admire you guys. Your authenticity, and your audience knows this, mm -hmm. and it's why they ride with you mm -hmm. everywhere. Your authenticity matters to you and cannot be compromised by any machines, not like not the NBA machine. I mean, he mm -hmm. went into the stands for mm -hmm. his brother and, and would do it again. Mm -hmm and would do it again no matter the cost because right. that's, I mean, that's where you guys live. Who doesn't want to ride with that? Yeah. No, completely agree. Um, but I was gonna say, my question to you was, as someone who studied journalism for 30 plus years, and, and Rachel, again, I posed this question to both you guys, how do you feel about athletes who are, for lack of a better word, cutting the line, so to speak, in this space and, and able to come in and tell our stories and have the trust from our brothers and sisters that have played the same sport, um, and that's kind of coming in. I wouldn't even say taking over, but I think there's definitely a, there's been a shift in the tide, and um, athletes are kind of coming and taking. We don't necessarily have to have the journal, uh, journalist credentials 
to be able to be successful in this space and someone who, again, prided themselves on, you know, your journalistic qualities and, and, and your body of work for so long. How do you feel about the athletes kind of coming in with this new wave of media? It's been fascinating to watch you guys shake the constructs. It's been fascinating to watch athletes understand they don't need the media because they can be their own media and without a filter. You don't have to go and make ESPN or someone else profit when you can keep all your profit by telling the story. I understand why my brethren would be threatened by the changing of that guard. In fact, when I've talked to former athletes who go into ESPN and work at ESPN, they're all stunned because they don't come from the environment of the locker room that's so competitive cutthroat. Uh, they're stunned by the insecurity in the room and the vanity business because it's not coachable people, it's ego, it's a, lot of, it's a lot of people who haven't had to earn what you guys have had to earn, the difficulties of what you had to climb over in order to get to what you did. And so I understand why it's threatening to us. You're shaking the machine. And, and when you say you're not taking over yet, you're threatening to mm -hmm. like you're you're mm -hmm. we are we are tired of the way we're covered i came up as a sports columnist what i learned from the writing about sports is you stand in judgment i'm embarrassed by some of the things that i wrote in my 20s about mm. alonzo morning should be loyal to the miami heat because xyz i've apologized to zoe i was in my 20s i'm learning from other columnists who have written mm -hmm. sports columns and what you do is you judge the athlete you write the provocative thing you guys are trying to provide a safe space for a different perspective. So you're allowing a broader view. I welcome it because it feels like democracy. It feels like meritocracy. But you're going to be met at a lot of turns with resistance from people who don't want that change because cutting the line or, or, or why do they get to, to do this when they haven't had you know, the 20 years of journalistic training? A lot of these words Dan used, and I hope y'all writing them down because I'm gonna need definitions of them. After the show. <laughs> I know you got me, yes, yeah, about six of them already. Right. Okay, all right. We can't really follow up what you said about us, but we honored too. Yeah, definitely. You know, uh, um, like he said, to piggyback on what he said, I, we had our own relationship too. So the biggest thing for us is me and Mac been through a lot. We bounced around the NBA a lot, but to have somebody believe in us is the best feeling, right? And, and to know you believe in us is priceless. So we thank you as well. Um, betting on yourself, you had to bet on yourself leading. What's the hardest part, the most gratifying part of uh, Metal Lock so far? Uh, the most gratifying part, what I say all the time, is getting to do it. Um, is is I don't I don't take for granted. The, I don't know how much guys you guys suffered sort of the grieving of your former identity of I was a professional mm. athlete. That transition can be very difficult. You're burying who you've been and who you've been working to be for 20 years. Getting out into freedom when I am the son of Cuban exiles and doing it principled, like the people who are with us are, we've got an unbelievably loyal audience. Loyal because they think they know us and me and what I'm about. And if my mentor's son gets fired, it's gonna be like, no, yep. we all leave now. Yep. All, all of right. us are going now. And when you connect with your audience from there, right? Because these are intimate, mediums and mine it's audio so we're like the friends in your head when you're at work maybe an unhappy job that you have for eight hours and we're getting you through four of them or a dark time or whatever because we're in this intimate space the idea that I get to do this with and for people I believe in the, the idea that I don't have to answer to anybody um, how can that not be gratifying when I could just make things they pay us to make things and they pay us to support the people who we want to make things with like that is real and genuine freedom from cuban parents who left an island fleeing communism and i never in my life have negotiated a contract for money ever i always negotiate freedom i didn't want to work at espn at disney for 10 years i resisted skipper's advances uh he needed a Latin person. Didn't Latin, they underrepresent with Latins. I don't even look Latin. My last name is French. So I had to get, I had to get a Steven Jackson. The, I, had to get the, I had to get the accent um, <laughs> so that I would look uh, Latin on television. But what ended up happening, right? So you rent, you rent my father's voice, but at the end I get to leave because you don't own mine. Mm. Mm. Real quick before you go on, Jack, I was just in the Bay. I was covering a game for the Kings. And I went to dinner with a friend of mine and we went to STK in San Francisco and the bartender, older white guy, knew me from the Warriors, 
uh, you know, came and, and, and brought his shots and he said, congratulations on teaming up with Metal Ark. I look forward to learning more about you and Steven. And I'm just like, so he knew who we were for basketball players. But again, I think that speaks to your audience because mm -hmm. Because we're with you guys now. They're looking forward to getting to know who we are. I, I cannot wait. Like, uh, I, I mean, I'm sure the people who follow here feel like they've got the breadth of your personality. But just in the stories that you were telling last night about what your journey has been and when I talk about my admiration for you guys, I don't think people understand how hard it was for you to get to the first of the 15 years or the 17 years in the league and how hard it is to stay yeah. here to stay there when all of the young people want your money and it's the world's most competitive place. There don't get to be many of you. Like um, it is, it, it's awe inspiring to behold, even though we get very used to seeing it on television every night, like your stories are amazing and I cannot wait to sit down and reverse this on you guys because the, the one time I interviewed him on television, he gave it all up. Like he gave it all up and and, and the stories were amazing, and I know he's got a thousand more. It's one of the most memorable interviews uh, <laughs> Highly Questionable has ever done because... Uh, it was Highly Questionable, uh, what he was talking about, too. Yeah, I got, yeah, for real. I got questions by a lot of people after that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we both high and questionable, yes. <laughs> oh, shit. Take us on set. Uh, how was the approach um, in, the, in your daily show now compared from when you started in the media space? Oh man, so I start as a newspaper columnist and um, I get to the sports reporters in Times Square. Uh, the construct is guys on Sunday morning judging athletes at the ESPN zone in Times Square. I'm 30 years old. I'm at the new, it's, it's downtown New York, ESPN zone. It smells like urine from the night before and vomit <laughs> and like chairs on tables. And I get there and I'm like, is that all there is? Uh, and it felt lonely. Uh, success didn't look like what I thought it would. And so I went on a path of how do I make this more communal? Writing is lonely. Uh, arriving at sports reporters didn't seem like the accomplishment I thought it would be. And so I wanted uh, group stuff, stuff that had laughter in it. I went uh, behind the scenes at PTI when that was starting. Kornheiser and Wilbon, behind the scenes, the show is much better than the show they do on air because they're yelling at each other and they're cursing. And the group of people they had around them, the sport team, like the people that you have here, they had relationships with, family. So it's jocular. It feels a little bit like a locker room. So I hear that laughter and the loneliness of writing. I'm like, no, no, I want, I want that. I want, that. I want mm -hmm. something I do with my friends. I want something that feels like laughter. I want something that's shared because... Or, yeah, writing is super lonely. Nobody can nobody can do it for you. I always identified as a writer for you know 15, 20 years growing up. They, that's the one thing people told me I was good at when I was young, and so that's what I chose because they didn't tell me I was good at anything else. And and then I I went and did fun things that that were meant to be counterculture. That were meant to hey, sports aren't that serious. I know we can take it all serious, but we can laugh with my dad or we can laugh with my co-host Dugat who. You know, we've got an odd couple relationship. So I've just been trying to create environments that are both fun and thoughtful, that they, that they have some range, that they can go between smart and, and dumb. And so that's, what, that's some of the stuff that we've been building. Mm, love it. Uh, transitioning a little bit, I uh, got a chance to meet your wife, Valerie, last night. Uh, I loved it. She had us all sign a cork to kind of remember. Oh, I'm supposed to bring night. it. I you forgot bring to it. bring it. I will leave it up to her. I know she's got it. But uh, speak to the effect that she's had on you as a man, a businessman, oh, and just all aspects. Oh, this is the part where you're going to try and get me to cry. They told me you guys are going to try and get me to cry. <laughs> um, so you want me to talk about love. All right, I'll talk about love, but I, you guys are going to have to share this with me. Um, okay. I simply would not be capable of doing this um, if I don't believe in myself the way that she believes in who I am. She thinks, I've never looked at myself this way. I'm not an entrepreneur. I, I've just wanted to be left alone to do these silly things we do. She thinks I'm a boss, and I would say she has made me one. Um, her strength is uncommon. She has turned upside down my worldview, and um, I just feel safe with my every vulnerability with her, and now I'm accomplishing things I never dreamed of. Uh, because of the strength in her backing me, because I wish to be the man that she thinks and believes I am. I, I aspire to it. And I it, um, I don't, 
I never knew what love was or that it could feel that way or how healing it could be in the places where I'm not gentle on myself. Like she has been a, a medicine, a balm that makes all of this possible. Like I, I could not do it if, if I didn't have with me a foreign feeling that I'd never known before that buoys me. Shout out Valerie, I love hearing that. I mean, behind every good man is a great woman. Yeah, you know what I mean. You always hear that, but you know to have. I wouldn't I, say she's behind me. I would say she's out in front. Like I, I, I uh, lost my brother recently, and um, you know, at his deathbed for a year, uh, he and I were praying that I might get to joy, a more joyous existence, uh, because I, ha I've, I have trouble all my life with joy um and i will only get there if, if i'm following her um obviously i know it's a tough topic um you lost your younger brother about four months ago jack lost his younger brother uh has it been a year that hasn't even been oh, a year yeah, oh, a little bit over a year ago um do you mind kind of just speaking to that and you know like you said you don't you told us off very like he was kind of almost like one of my kids because i don't have children and that's how close your guys's bond was so this is uh it's a long story and it's uh, the hardest thing I've ever experienced. It's a pain that has not gone away. It is with me when I wake up in the morning when we briefly touched on it. I don't know what he was feeling right before we started, but Stephen had to compose himself because of whatever it is. I don't know how long, uh, how long ago did you say? A little over a year. And the grief, I don't know if men talk about this either privately or publicly enough. Um, it is a horror that um, a, a physical pain in my stomach that is sadness um, that reminds me that it's there even when I'm laughing. Mm. I can be laughing about something transported and the reminder is there that my brother is not here. Um, I have isolated from people because I don't want to keep rummaging through this bin. It hurts too much and avoidance sometimes feels easier. Uh, but the specifics of the horror, a year daily next to a deathbed, a vibrant, colorful personality who did a career harder than mine, art. He was a successful professional artist. He was braver than I was. He was more charismatic than I was. He was my little brother. I never imagined a scenario in which he would die. To watch his body wither away, to watch people need to pick him up to go to the bathroom every day, to have the memories of that, um, seared in my sleep in a way that doesn't uh, give me any rest. It's been the most painful thing I've endured by leaps and bounds, but I am so grateful that I got that ear next to him to solve all the little brother, big brother shit, to ask forgiveness for everything, to, to not have in like the horror that is my grief, there is no guilt. There is no guilt because I said all the things and he went loved. And, and I, um, I'm deeply appreciative that I didn't lose him suddenly. Like even though I would wish on no one to watch, to, to, to watch a body, a vibrant body, an athletic body decompose in front of you. He didn't have the use of the bottom half of his body for the last six months, but he wanted to stay here. Um, I'd ask you to explore grief with me because I haven't I'm I have not spent a lot of time doing this with others because it it hurts to everyone's got their own experience with this it is different for for everybody um but I I don't have the words to articulate to you the level of pain that this caused and the belief that I will have a greater appreciation for the growth on the other side of that pain because of what I learned next to that bed every day for a year Thank you for sharing that. I mean, Jack, it's it, it's been a little over for a year for you, and and obviously, we all know how hard you like. Where where are you kind of at with your situation? Still, I mean, it's, I mean, it's tough. You know, again, I I, I told this briefly before we got on air. How Jack and I got so close was the loss of my mom, and I'm on the the opposite spectrum from you and, and, and your brother. My mom was diagnosed with four cancers November 1st and died November 27th. So I had literally what, 26 days, <clears throat> but it was when I was playing for the Warriors and, and I was just gone. And, and Jack was the one every day where he was, you know, whether he was calling to 
crack jokes to make me laugh, bringing me food, coming to sit and watch TV or movies, coming to bring me some, some weed to smoke. Like Jack was the guy <clears throat> that was kind of just checking on me every day. Didn't want nothing, didn't want nothing in return, just was the one. And, and, and overall, the whole Warriors organization was great, but, you know, Jack really went out of his way to just let me know he was there. And, and, and when I was ready to talk or needed to talk, he would be the ear and the shoulder I can talk on. And I think what I've learned since then is, you know, the pain never goes away. You just learn how to manage it over time. You know what I mean? And I felt like... It doesn't seem real to me still. Like yeah. even you're going, you're going to a deathbed. You're going to a hospital every day. Like at, for it to still not feel like a real thing months after the fact, I can't imagine what you're talking about seems so un far, unreachable uh, right. to me. You, you mm -hmm. said 16, 17 16 years. years. Yeah. Uh, it it seems <clears throat> it's uh, it's almost a mountain too overwhelming to climb. Yeah. The uh, the idea that I'm going to believe this is real. It's the realest thing in the world. Right. You're by a deathbed with a cancer patient mm -hmm. and to me it doesn't I don't know if it's the same for you it doesn't seem like a, a, a real thing even though I've lived the whole thing yeah it's, it's just a crazy experience for me Dan I lost my little sister two months for my little brother so I lost both my siblings two months apart I ain't ready to talk about it mm, I'm sorry bro um <clears throat> let's speak to your upbringing started here in New York before you moved to Florida you know parents sacrificed a lot coming from Cuba uh, explain your kind of upbringing and, 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 and the values and, 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 and principles you were raised with from two people who didn't start in the States. Um, work. Work means freedom. Work is how you get ahead in this country. There have been any number of things over the last... You all right? Mm-hmm. I, I wonder sometimes whether avoidance is the best thing on that. Forgive me. I'll answer your no. question in a second. But I, well, I, I marveled. I, I did a, an interview with Marcellus Wiley, like, and he's, he's such a tough human being. And his hands are gnarled as he's sort of telling the story of, of being asked to close his mom's casket. And he's just chosen the path of avoidance because he's like, if I don't avoid, he's, he's a, obviously a very tough man. But he's like, that's too much for me to handle. Whatever you're feeling uh, there, uh, where I, I would counsel you from what little I know in these four months, you shouldn't stuff all of that down. You should share it with somebody. Maybe not, yeah, maybe no, it's too much, to. maybe I it's not here, to. but mm -hmm. but anyways, my, my parents, um, they came from Cuba. They, they left in their teenage years. They get on planes, freedom is lost, get on planes. They think they're gonna see their family soon. It goes many, many years without seeing their family. Imagine what the desperation has to be on an island where people literally throw their lives to the winds on like inner tubes. The, the, between Cuba and Miami is the biggest cemetery. Any, that ocean is the biggest cemetery that you will find because so many people are literally, the desperation pushes them out. So my parents as teenagers come to this country and make their way, believing this country to be a certain thing, which it was for them, a land of opportunity, a land where they would, I would never have to make any sacrifices because they made all of them. They got me to freedom. And the way you get to freedom is through work. That's how immigrants do it, exiles do it. This country has a lot of economies that thrive off Hard you work. You work. And so in that, I got almost the entirety of my identity in, in ways that probably aren't healthy, but have been successful. I'm lopsided. Lopsided in the ways, you know, you guys can be, I, I would imagine that to be as great as you were at basketball, you couldn't have time for much of anything else. It had to be an obsession that you were doing all the time, every day, thinking about all the time, always pressurized and so well, i made time for i made time for weed and strip clubs too so <laughs> strip clubs I, yeah I, I got all that in so those are your those yeah. are those are your three. even split okay. even split yeah that was dedicated to all of them same the one thing i will say is jack has his jersey retired in two atlanta strip clubs three stop three, three. three. excuse me yeah Oh, but Three. then people get the impression, though, that you don't work, that some holy man reached into your crib and just made you a better right. basketball player <laughs> than people. Like, okay, yeah, you had fun because you had to blow off steam, but you guys had to be obsessive, compulsive to, to be to. great in a way that's not even reasonable. Um, your relationship with your father. Obviously, the world got the chance to know him and love him uh, on your show. Um, how's he doing, and, and, and what's that that? process of father-son been like for you? I mean, it's so great and interesting in so many ways. Uh, my father 
worked for, um, I'm going to say, this is so funny, all of this. My father didn't know how to tell me he didn't want to do the television show anymore because he's worked all his life. He was approaching 80 and the celebrity and the stuff, you know, getting, you know, free tuna sandwiches and slapped on the back at Heat Games. He's 80. He just wants to shuffle around the house and be left alone. So he tells ESPN that he's underpaid and he wants to be paid more because he can't figure out a way to tell me he doesn't want to do the show that. anymore. Uh. And he figures, well, ESPN won't give him the raise. And they called this bluff and they gave him more money. <laughs> and so my father ends up winning at the end, but at the very end of what we were doing, he really didn't want to do it anymore. But the eight years that we had before that are the biggest professional blessing of my life because I got closer with my father than I'd ever been. Uh, in, in retirement, I allowed him to do something with his later years that felt like he was genuinely helping me, and he was because he was the star of the show. I gave him a TV show, and he fucker stole it from me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and one of the greatest delights and surprises in, in all of that, and you guys could speak to the barbershop quality of this, when Memorial Day weekend in Miami... Oh, it's different. No, no, but when he goes in his car... He is a king. Black people love my father mm -hmm. more than <laughs> Latin people do. Probably. I'm not kidding you. It's probably because like, of his rap lyrics. Poppy lit. Poppy, he just lit. He get it. <laughs> it I, I'm not kidding you that that was one of the... How would I have imagined that from, from where it is that we started? So my father's doing the show in his second language. He doesn't really know anything about sports. But my earliest memory was like walking with my little hand in his into a magical stadium. And it was a father-son connection. And I learned sp the, to love sports. And the energy of that was like, how do I connect with my father through sports? So to be able to be on television and, and with my father, and then this part was important because my CEO, John Skipper, was working very hard to try and diversify the opinions and the voices and the perspectives at ESPN. Every single person who sat next to my father was always a minority with another voice. It was important to me to put that on the platform. All of them made more likable, as I was, because my father was in the middle of it providing the laughs providing the show that made it just this much different than the other shows on ESPN. I love it. Can you give us uh, Poppy's introduction of you? Today, we have introducing Steven Jackson. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome said, to the show. He says he's going, he says he's going to perfect it. And it's it. only going to get better. It's, it's only going to get better. It's pretty good. Who were some of the uh, journalists that you looked up to as you was coming up? Um... So I, I guess these would all be too old. You guys would age out like I, they're all too old, I would think, uh, for you. Uh, Gary Smith was a great writer at Sports Illustrated. He wrote profiles. He wrote three or four a year where he would really, uh, and this is one of my attractions to the sociology of sports because I'm more interested in the human condition in it than I am in even the drama of the games. He'd write these profiles of people where he would interview 50 people before he started writing. And when I was in college reading one of them, I threw the Sports Illustrated across the, the dorm room because I didn't think I would ever be that good at being able to capture the essence of some, who somebody was. But he wasn't an opinion giver. There were, there, these weren't essays. They, these were just rich, deep profiles of let me explain who Steven Jackson is to you in ways that Steven Jackson mm -hmm. will read and learn about himself because, <laughs> wow. because he's taking the care wow. that a journalist should mm -hmm. to get it right, to be fair, to tell the story correctly, to tell it thoroughly. And so, uh, you know, my, my early influencers weren't the opinion givers. They were the people who could tell a human story about a human being that made me feel something that would attach to them. So now I'm not just rooting for sports. I'm not rooting for the regional identity of my team. I'm rooting f for this guy, this guy, because I like what they're about. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, wrote for the Miami Herald in the 90s. One story that you're proud of that you wrote and one story you covered that you regret. Oh, wow. Okay. So uh, uh, I, I went to Cuba. Uh, I wrote an assortment of articles from Cuba, you know, visiting my parents' homeland, seeing the way, the, the stories of their childhood uh, that they described as palatial. I saw a place stuck in the 1950s. I, I sat on the steps of their 
uh, home, old home, and wept because, you know, this, this island, this childhood, this freedom, this was all taken from them. Uh, and so the, the stuff that I wrote about Cuba where I was explaining to my aunt, to, where I was giving a Cuban voice nationally to, to how Hispanic people feel and also telling uh, personally intimate stories that were meaningful to me. Uh, and I, I have a lot of regrets about things that I wrote in my 20s uh, just because I was trying to learn how to be a columnist. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I was a columnist at 26. I, I, it was too early for me to, ha to be given the right to have opinions that would put in print something that judged you guys as less than because of an athletic performance or because you took too much money, you know, you took, you were, you were holding out over money or whatever. I didn't have, a, I didn't have worldviews that were formed and shaped. I just knew how to write things that were incendiary or, you know, and I would learn over time. That's not who I want to be. That's not who I want to be. It's just, if that was what success looked like, when I'm telling you, the, the storytellers who are telling the long stories about things, those are like poets. Those, that's a hard way to make a living. The ones who were getting rewarded were the ones who were getting engagement because they were crushing you guys or having you know very strong opinions. And you've seen what's happened in the last 20 years with sports debate television and stuff, how all this stuff gets crueler when the path to success and attention is well, you gotta you gotta come down on the athlete. Yeah. You gotta tell you gotta sh you gotta show them that we're the customer, we're mm -hmm. the fan, mm -hmm. and we're the ones who deserve X, Y, and Z. Like mm -hmm. you guys, grew how many how many rip jobs did you guys? Well, how many things did you guys read about yourselves mm -hmm. that you had to hide from your children? Mm -hmm. No, I mean it was a lot. I couldn't. I th it was all on TV. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't no, hide it. I think uh, you made a great point from a standpoint of what the standard is now to 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 grow. Um, in sports media when it when it comes to debate shows and you know I was over at ESPN and there were times where the producer would want me to say stuff that I just wasn't I'm not gonna say that you know I'm not comfortable saying that but like you said I feel like and this is no knock on anyone who's been able to kind of climb those corporate ladders in those spaces I feel like the the more outlandish the the, the louder the wilder the take um, you have whether white or wrong you're rewarded for and you start climbing the ladder because again, like I said, whatever the angle is, whether it's bashing athletes or keeping it real or whatever the fuck they want to call it, it's getting clicks, it's getting views and, 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 and you're becoming a personality, you know, on this platform. So I was always just very comfortable with staying in my lane over there and, you know. Oh, but you were already famous. You yeah. al you already knew what had came with bit. the currency right. of attention. You had, you had money there, like, yeah, if you're a careerist, perhaps you'd have to compromise your principles right. because would you, would you? Yeah. To, to get ahead. And you're not even mad about it. Like I said, I, I get it and I understand it. But we talked about it last night at dinner, you know, when it when it comes to certain things. And this is no knock on anyone. I just I value relationships more than I value views or clicks, I guess. Like I love the fact that I could still call former teammates and, and ask for a favor or ask them to do interviews or ask them to come on the show. And I feel like some athletes once they cross that line, like there is no going back with some of their former teammates or colleagues or people they played in the league with, because it's not that I wouldn't even call it the dark side, but it's just like they've kind of fully embodied this media persona now that athletes are looking at them like, you used to play here. How can you even say something like that? You know what I mean? And I never wanted to be on that, but I saw that if you didn't kind of do that, you get an opportunity to climb up in the space. What happened with you? You had some experiences like that? Well, I can't imagine people were trying to tell you what to be saying about anything. ESPN? Anywhere. Uh, ESPN was the only place that I, had, I, I got rubbed the wrong way. Um, one, they didn't want to pay me, but I think the whole, the whole reason why they didn't want to pay me because I embarrassed um, Woj on TV. I embarrassed him on TV. We was on a I had a situation where he was saying something about Jimmy Butler, and me and Jimmy had a great relationship, and I didn't believe it when he said it. So off air, I called him. And we was on commercial break, and I hit him, and he said it wasn't true. And you know, Rachel's my girl, and I told Rachel, Rachel, don't don't say it now. Wait till we get back on air, mm -hmm. and I and I told him that wasn't true on air, and I you know showed him the the message from Jimmy, and after that, it, my relationship, <laughs> I stopped working as much. <laughs> Gina started giving me calls like. Uh, we gotta start figuring something else. Have you, well, have you talked to guys at Fox? Like I knew it was about to be over because nobody never did him like that. But I knew he was full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, Dan, on a, uh, on another note, um, you know the transition 
that has been made with someone like a Pat McAfee um, transitioning into ESPN and really kind of doing it his way or as close to his way as can be. Obviously, just called out a, a studio head in, in Norby Williamson um, lately. Um, what are your thoughts, you know, kind of being in that and now looking at it from an outside perspective? Uh, it's fascinating here, and I think uh, you guys will find much of this very interesting. It's going to take uh, some telling, and I, and I want to be careful because I support people who bet on themselves. I don't want to appear like I'm bitter f at ESPN or that I'm not rooting for Pat McAfee because I want everybody uh, to get their money. He's creative. He's charismatic. Uh, but what do you guys know about the details of my story? Because the last straw was them letting go of uh, my mentor's son without telling me. But what do you guys know about the previous parts of the story and where it is I was getting in hot water and what I was bumping against when I was bumping against it? I don't know the details, and I don't know if Jack, I don't know what's well, going to be I, I, I just, from what, just all I, I'll just say this. I knew from being at ESPN and being from Gina, I knew your show was the show that was one quote away from being kicked off ESPN. That's what I always felt. And that, and that was the mode around talk, every time I seen your show or people talking about your show ESPN, like that's the show that, that, that treads the line. All right, so let me tell you where the backstory is because I think you, I guys, to be. you guys will find fascinating sort of uh, the corridors of power and how some of this stuff works. So John Skipper, the CEO of Metal Lark, was running ESPN and I was there I got suspended for silly things. I put up billboards at, at, at LeBron's return to Cleveland saying, you're welcome, Miami, you know, and, <laughs> and I put, and I got suspended got for that. suspended for that? I got suspended for that. It was a joke. Uh, it was funny. It was great. It was mm -hmm. super I got, but I got suspended for silly things. I got suspended for selling my Hall of Fame vote uh, to Deadspin in baseball because I was like, come on, athletes, they're going to use healing things if they're competitive on steroids. Can we stop keeping them out of the Hall of Fame? And I sort of sold my vote away because I didn't like the moralizing there. But when Skipper leaves, a new president comes in charge and there's a new policy. And the first time I got in trouble with him is when Trump is going after four women of color of political power, uh, one of them a refugee from Somalia who is advocating for how inhumane the cages are at the borders where there are brown babies. And what is being shouted at the protest rally is send her back, the crowd of Trump people. And so the first time I get in trouble is calling bullshit on that policy, saying you cannot tell a son of exiles that I'm not allowed to talk about this unless an athlete says about it first, something about it first, so that I can then use him as a meat shield, which is what their policy was. If it's news, you can talk about politics, but I'm like, these microphones matter, man. And if you, I'm not going to just talk about whether the Pacers are better with Halliburton. Like, I, I come, like the, if you're going to give me the power to represent a minority for you on television, if I'm going to be a Hispanic man with my Hispanic father as a cartoon that we're going to have fun with, because all right, I'll, we'll do your game. When the microphone's got to matter because they're chanting, send her back. I can't say anything about how racist that is. I can't say anything about how that's not the America I signed up for. Like, send her back because she's trying to get cages, like kids in cages at the border, and I gotta... So that's where, it's, that's where it starts, right? On the compromising of the principles, the dilutions by degrees. So, to have had access at that time to the most powerful man in sports who was an ally of mine who wanted me to start little fires, but he's not out to the Disney power machine after George Floyd to have like to be in there and be like, wait a minute, can I get to Iger and Disney on like real change stuff to now watch cowboy hats make a mess with Aaron Rodgers that gets to Iger and Disney and, and gets to the top of the power chain because he's got the power to not need ESPN anymore because these brands have like ESPN needs this now, they have to, so they make all sorts of precedents for him. He can curse on television and everything else. And again, I need to make this clear, like more power to him mm -hmm. because Pat McAfee, you have done an amazing job of realizing before anybody else did, 
that this was a space that the people who were actually dominating this space weren't as good at competition as you are mm -hmm. because an a punter got into the space and right. figured it all out. I can knock these journalists out of the way. So may he have all of the fun and chaos and anarchy that is shaking that machine from the inside because to me it's it's comedy to to watch it but the portions of it that hurt are like man i was so close with whatever our show was which was sort of like that to to getting into the real uh, you know corridors of power where i could have maybe influenced how, how it made a change in how bullshit corporate the statements were after George Floyd. How, how, like, because you've seen the machine, the, whatever was happening that moment after the pandemic, that year after George Floyd, to see the machine that was saying to us, well, you know, at every turn, no, we're, we're, the Black Lives Matter now, to see it now shift and everything go back to the way that it was. It has been a little jarring given that at that moment, I remember it, we were in it, it lasted for a while, it felt empowering, it felt strong, it felt like, oh, okay, maybe, maybe people will be heard to see the machine go right back to where it was. I, how do I say any of that and walk you guys down that path without sounding like I'm bitter at ESPN or bitter at McAfee? Like, I, I wanna walk that path honestly, but that's, that's how it happened from my viewpoint. So to see him call out by name an executive, when I, like I had to go and when I said what I said, I had to go meet with Pataro in New York and there were headlines and then stuff gets leaked about what my salary is and all the stuff that he's complaining about started happening to us at the end. I enjoyed seeing him call, call it out. I was surprised to see that there were no consequences for the person that he called out or for him, but it's a new age over there. They have to make the compromises because I think they need him more than he needs them. Mm, I said that the other day. So, I mean, currently, where do you think, maybe not even just ESPN, but like the machines that make this sports media go, where are they? They're kind of at a crossroads because I, I wholeheartedly believe that these bigger, the, the personalities have, have outgrown the machines. I feel the machines will always be there and, and they're great for what they're great at, but they're not necessarily needed anymore. So where does ESPN, Fox, where do you kind of think they sit in the whole grand scheme of things as journalism or reporting or athletes moving into this space kind of take over? Uh, it'll be super interesting because there's been a monopoly in this space of what's on your television when you're walking through the airport bar. Like, I don't think that people understand what the business model of ESPN is. All of those shows exist as infomercials just to get you to the next game. Like, here is sports content, whatever it is. How do we get you to the games, to the games, to the games? They decided to become a journalism company because... They didn't have to be from the very beginning. It, it, there's not a J in ESPN. It's entertainment and sports. They decided to be a journalism company that was initially run by newspaper people. Uh, they're sort of getting out of that business now, and they're going to need those personality-driven people, to, whether it's McAfee or Stephen A. Smith, um, to, to help their brand because the whole, the whole game has, has changed. The programming matters. It's... It, McAfee needs to do a number after first take because of the way that they're paying these people. Like uh, they're, they're trying to keep up now with a changing game as the streaming service, service, services just change everything. Mm. Kind of a little bit off topic, but not. Is there any truth to this urban legend that Disney was trying to stop the, the Miami Zoo from naming a hippo after you? Now, it's not an urban legend. There is now a Miami Zoo that has a hippo named Dan Levitar. No, but that's all true. Yes, that was, they were fearing the liability of the hippo escaping named Dan Levitar. And then you got Disney's Dan Levitar <laughs> tramples three kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The first thing I Are did. Are you the, kidding me? No, the first thing I did, we, the, as, uh, the first act of freedom after leaving ESPN was going to that zoo. That, there is, an, there is not, no longer a baby hippo. There is a hippo at Zoo Miami named Dan Levitard, who hopefully doesn't trample any kids say, to has death. Has he escaped anybody? Yeah, escaped we're hoping yet? that doesn't happen. <laughs> you haven't met him? I, uh, I have met him, yeah. Went, met, went to meet him, meet him the first day. But isn't that, it, isn't that instructive as you guys build your own thing? When you're corporate 
you have to fear things like this joke we're making with this hippo, I have to fear the liability of what happens if the hippo tramples everybody. I, I look forward to you guys making everything you do without any of those constraints. <laughs> Facts. I definitely don't want a hippo. I know you kind of uh, feel the same way about your dolphins, how I feel about my cowboys. You know, the only thing that saves Tua and the Dolphin fans is what happened to your cowboys. How about them boys? Yeah, to your fans. That's a good excuse. But y'all on the same on the same boat no. with us in Cancun. No. What you mean? A no. loss is we all at home. No. You guys have had three straight 12 win seasons. Shit to bed every time in the playoffs. Miami is a new up and coming team with a young. How many Super Bowls Miami got? Uh, I don't know. Two. That's not my team. Huh? Two. How many we got? Damn. Five. What well, you were you were five last time they won a Super Bowl. And I wasn't born when they won theirs. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so shit, what's the point? What's the, point? The, the Dolphins, uh, I, I think I read the other day, uh, yeah, this was Ethan Skolnick said this, that uh, Dwayne Wade uh, went, to high, uh, went to college, uh, had a Hall of Fame pro career, and got a statue in all of the time since the Dolphins last won a playoff mm. game. It's a long run. I know you feel how I feel. What about the Heat? How you feel about the Heat right now? I mean, you guys have to marvel at everything they are. They embody so many of the things that uh, you guys were about, where if you go there and are willing to work, uh, they will make all players better. It, to me, what, it's been amazing to watch what Pat Riley has been there, built there since the beginning because what he's got on, on the bay there in Miami is a military silo where those basketball players are united in nothing more than how do they get better at this thing so that Gabe Vincent can get his contract, so that Max Struess can get his contract, so that you guys have played with so many guys, and this is no knock on Gabe Vincent or Max Struess, but what they build where they get guys to believe in the idea of hard work will pay off and all of us making money, like that's how you get a, a team of players rowing in the right direction no matter who their players are. Like you, it's not easy to be as good as they've been for as long as they've been with as many different players as they've had. I, I did not think Jimmy Butler was that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, Jimmy Butler. Did you guys think Jimmy Butler was good enough to carry a team to the to? The I knew he had the heart. I didn't know if, I didn't know he was good enough to do it. You I, know didn't, what I, mean? I didn't. I didn't when know he it until it I saw it a couple it. times. I didn't know it till I saw it. I've always been a big fan of Jimmy. I didn't know it till I saw it. But I also think it too. Obviously, it's the environment Riles has created, but then also Spo. I think Spo is one of the best minds in the NBA. But think about that though. You, he was in the video room. Like all he's done, you know, the, the root of culture is cult. That is a cult. <laughs> like that play, like that. He grew up in the dark recesses of the thankless video room. Yeah. And he climbs to, he's gonna be running that franchise next. Yes. An eight year contract. That when you can sell that to your employees as a way of life, like it, it feels like a mafia family. It's, it, I, I could have been- Mafia Pat. I could have been a heat player, man. Uh, two drills, three man weaving, seventeens. That's I, that's the reason why I didn't end up being a Miami Heat player. We did that shit for the first three minutes of practice. Nah, I don't want to be here. This, <laughs> what you say? Not, I, I, I don't love it as much as I thought I did. I definitely don't. <laughs> I definitely don't. And if I gotta throw up every practice to make a million dollars, maybe I need to go on another team where that's not in the contract. <laughs> <laughs> the Marlins. Oh my God! They have they've uh, hurt Miami so many different ways. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean they they but they betrayed they they sold after championships. They sold all their players. Like they've crushed generations of fan bases by taking the feel good immediately and making it all about just finances. So somehow, in a Latin city where an economy was supposed to flourish around our love for baseball and how flamboyantly. Because baseball's changed. I don't know if you guys watch it all, but baseball is more colorful and more ethnic and more joyous. Uh, we are a broken baseball city. Uh, there are, there's a niche group of people who believe in the Marlins, but they don't spend. They can't keep up. And I think, I think as we tape this, that the Dodgers have spent $1.7 <laughs> billion dollars on free agents and the Marlins have not yet spent a dollar. Mm, they definitely do it. That. Hard mm. to keep up that way. Is... The undefeated uh, Dolphins winning a Super Bowl that year is the best moment in Miami sports history. 
Oh man, so it's so long ago. It's I don't know how long ago your your uh, memories go on childhood. So I'm, I was born in '68. '72 was the proudest thing. Football was football made Miami famous because they were successful at it. At the time, it wasn't a thriving town. The Dolphins were something that made it huge. But I would say, in in my lifetime, the most fun I've ever had covering things in sports. Thirty years in that market was covering the championship University of Miami teams that were urinating on all of sportsmanship and making America insane because they won and were crazy. So covering those teams was great fun because, you know, Jimmy Johnson would say, um, this week against Notre Dame, we're not going to have any trash talking and then would make the captain the safety of the team who called himself the Grim Reaper and took a pa picture in the paper leaning against a, a tombstone that read, shut up, bitch. Uh, <laughs> and, he, and he made him a captain. Like those teams were renegades first. Uh, and then the LeBron era heat where you, you don't rare, you rarely get these situations that, are, that actually feel like the country is against you on something. And so the LeBron era heat were like crack cocaine for four years, caring about regular season game 17 because the Heat are 9-8 and eight, and LeBron has bumped Spolster on his way off the court. Give me your opinion on that team, though. Ed Reed, uh, Edwin James. No, that was before. I dog. mean, uh, I'm talking yeah. about uh, the Warrens, Fred Gore. The Warrens, no, I mean, they've those had are so before many. that. They, they've had, that was like Michael. Yeah, that was no, like. No, I was saying they had uh, like two, three running backs at the same time. You're, you're allowed point. to get confused because I think Frank Gore, Clinton Portis, yeah, they all and, yeah. and McGahey were yeah, all, all at the same, same time. Yeah, that's what I mean. Them three, and yeah. No, it, it all runs together because, yeah, those. But it's not just that. I'm like those, the two live two. I was talking about the two live crew. Uncle Luke, Miami Hurricanes. Oh, yeah. Mike Irvin. See, no, but yeah. that's that's what, yes, that's what, well before Snoop Dogg was on USC's sideline when they yeah. were winning championships, and before. You know, even like Ice Cube was wearing a, a Raiders jacket or there were people on the West Coast wearing Miami jackets because of what Miami represented. Uncle Luke, you'll love this story. Uncle Luke was uh, as the, you know, one of the originators of hip hop Miami sound uh, who, who would say things like Suge Knight can't come into Miami unless he asks my permission. He was putting bounties on Notre Dame players that was collected with NFL money on anybody who injured Tim Brown or whatever. There's this pool of money and it was being held by the team priest. How can you not love <laughs> those? Shit. How can you not love yeah. those football <laughs> teams? I love it. I love it. Oh yeah. I love it. That's dope. Uh, obviously shout out Dwayne Wade. You mentioned it earlier, but he, uh, will we have a, he will have a statue out there um you know being there his entire career um to me i think he's a top three shooting guard of all time behind him and cove um just thoughts on his journey and his career uh what a joy to watch from start to finish because i remember uh when he came in initially one of the things people were all they, he was clearly on the path to start him like it was about to happen he was still accessible still and, and, and the janitors and the people who worked in the building would ask him not to change. Please don't change because you're so approachable, you're so accessible and stuff. To watch that guy have the 20 year career he has had, to watch the greatness that would rank him among the all time greats at doing that and at that size, to see him grow into an even better man because he changed in all the best ways. He didn't change being personal, personable and professional, but now that dude's a civic leader. That dude like, helped LeBron with whatever the strength was in wearing the hoodies for Trayvon Martin because they found their voice as leaders. Were, like, to see him be better as a man than he was as a basketball player, to see him be better as a leader on behalf of his daughter, to fight against just hate, he loves like that he has learned how to love big so that he uses his power to combat hate we've never had an athlete better than that in south florida I've, i don't have an athlete i can say that about like he grew into a he grew into a man that any of us would be honored to know and inspired by his behavior to say that his basketball career I, i'm not going to say it pales compared to anything but what I've seen him grow into, to me, is moving in ways that are truly inspirational about like what you want human beings to grow into through the platform and strength of sports, like mm -hmm. a beast. Yeah, now shout out D-Way, definitely a, 
you know, great player, but even better human. Uh, recently, 21 Savage uh, had an impersonation of your show with the music video. Uh, we talked about it a little bit, but <laughs> thoughts on this? <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, that characterization of me is deeply racist. Uh, <laughs> Uh, stereotypical, <laughs> oh, bloated, shit. thick. My father doesn't have a mustache. It, it looks nothing like that. But I do like the juxtaposition of saying that my, uh, my character is deeply racist. But Bomani's? Exactly right. They got it. They got <laughs> it. They got whoever, it. Whoever playing Bomani, he fresh out. Jail. <laughs> right? They just that's let ex- him out. That's he just exactly got the bus. right. That's exactly right. <laughs> But thoughts, I mean, overall, I mean, 21 being one of the hottest artists in this oh, game right now. I don't understand, that, you know, Matt. Showing love like this. So, Matt, I'm, I'm, I don't know you guys well enough yet to know how spiritual you are or what it is that uh, the universe brings you in terms of comedy or blessings, okay? I have no reason at 55 years old to connect with the young sports fan who is 19 or 20 years old who does so now. But things like that are always happening to us uh, in, in ways that I can't help but feel moved by yeah. inspiration, find real inspiration in the idea of, of course, it's ridiculous, it's funny. But yes, at one point, my father and 21 Savage talked on television and he remembered it enough to do that. And I will tell you guys, both of you, the hardest I have ever seen Udonis Haslam laugh, the hardest, is when I came into the highly questionable studio and my father was holding him up because he was leaning, laughing on his shoulder, and all they were looking at were those rap collaborations my father was doing with, with rappers. And so, <laughs> like, <laughs> Dan was like, what is it called? He was at dinner, what is it called oh, when my dad's rapping me. with the rappers? Like, uh, what is it called? I'm like, it's a collab. No, I did worse than that. No, I said duet. I did the wor- I did worse than that. I was like, Dan, I definitely like I don't said. think it's that shit. I, <laughs> Thank I you for not shaming me shit. publicly with that. That was a private conversation. Oh, I was embarrassed man. enough where it was happening. That was good. I did. I looked um, across the table and, yeah, my father, those duets he does with the rappers. <laughs> oh, shit. Who is, who's Dan outside of media, outside of running Meadowlark? Um, he burned out just as much as who's, us. Who, who's the day-to-day guy? Um, Well, this project, self-employment, has been uh, so uh, fun, exhilarating, overwhelming uh, that I I haven't gotten what I would love to have uh, is is work-life balance. What I would like to be doing uh, is get to a point in my life uh, before, you know, freedom expires that... um, that I can have more fun outside of what I'm doing. What we're presently doing is consuming, okay? So I don't have kids. The people that I work with are people that I've largely raised professionally. Like they haven't worked in other places. They've gone from being, um, you know, people who learned under us 20 years later, they now have their own kids. And it's my responsibility to make sure that all those people, like it's now my responsibility to make sure that everything works so that those people that, those, I don't have kids, so I. This is what passes. For, for, this is what this is what passes for. This is what, um, and and so what I what I hope um, people think of me is that I am someone who tries uh, to spread love and decency to people he cares about, um, and I, I, you know I spend a lot of time in that space trying to provide for others creatively and other ways. But I, it, embarrass me, it embarrasses me that I don't have a better answer to your question because I'm so lopsided at the moment trying to take on this yeah. big undertaking of, I don't consider myself a businessman. I have business people, but you can't, you can't build a corporation that cares unless you're the one personally caring for all of the details so that you make sure. And, and, it, and it's hard, it's, it is hard to build a corporation with a soul. It's why most of them don't have mm. one. I just love hearing that because again, I'm, I'm two, three years behind the process you started and you know, giving the chance to pick your brain last night and, and looking forward to you know, talking to John and picking his brain, just the ups and downs and the ebbs and flows of this. You know, I was literally talking about like, I do a ton of shit, but I'm gonna have to cut that out because this is, you know, all the smoke productions and teaming up with you guys is 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 my baby, is our baby, and we look forward to again partnering with you guys and 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 changing, you know, the landscape. But at the same time, it's not 
it's not something you talk about. It's something you have to do and the hours you have to put in. You can't cheat that. Well, I, I'd ask you guys, uh, I'd love some guidance on this front. Um, I, because you guys are athletes and because you're coachable and because there's so much failure, no matter how great you are, I've had a real tough time mentally dealing with uh, failure as learning, like tr treating it like, oh, we're a startup. Ooh, we fell in this hole because, you know, you're trying to figure things out. That's, that's learning. Be gentle on yourself. Like, you've got to figure these things out. I'd ask you guys how it is that you handle that because I've always marveled at athlete ability to deal with failure when your entire job is based on being paid for success. I mean, I'll start with that personally. I, I feel like as long as you learn something from the failure or the loss, it's not necessarily a blemish. You know what I mean? Like, no one is, you know, Michael Jordan missed a ton of shots. Kobe missed a ton of shots. People lost. LeBron's lost a ton of finals. But I think when you're able to learn from those mishaps, those mistakes, or those shortcomings, as long as you got something out of it to be able to apply you from hopefully not hitting it again, you know, it, it's a long game. And I think today is such instant gratification to everything and understanding anything worth building or anything worth doing is going to take some time. It's a slow burn, like, you know, rest in peace, Nipsey Hussle. It's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. You know, it hasn't so I been look slow at for you guys, though. Like, it, I mean, it hadn't. You guys have. No, we jumped. You, no, we, we made a jump. But at the same time, you know, being able to slow down and still learn, you know, because we don't want to. Although, like I said earlier, maybe it was a good. We, we kind of cut the line. So we've been able to get a multi-year deal and team up with someone like you guys. But I think what I'm most excited about is learning from you guys. You know what I mean? Again, because you guys are have had a. 30 year run in this space and you've seen a lot of people come and go and a lot of different things happen. So being able to almost be like a bigger brother to us and, and, and hopefully allowing us to not maybe hit some of the same pitfalls you guys hit, um, you know, outside of making great content. Um, that's what I look forward to most of really kind of having like a mentor and a whole company that believed in us that wants to bring us along to where they're going is what I appreciate. It, honestly, you, you honor me when you say that because I would imagine from the two of you, and I don't take this part lightly, I don't pretend to know you, but I've uh, marveled at your work for 15 years as someone who cares about sports and, and hope to know you very well. Um, what I have seen over uh, the years of where athletes mistrust on business because the problems that come with money, uh, for you guys to trust us with your business and your future, you two specific guys, not just anybody, uh, it honors me that you would do business like that with us and I believe in it wholeheartedly. Like I'm going to learn from you as well because um, it is inevitable that we're going to conquer things here because uh, we've got the right people in place during a changing media time and you guys are going to bring the same competition to this that you did when you were winning at mm -hmm. basketball because mm -hmm. winning is winning like you guys are conquerors yeah. you guys are conquerors probably less clothes lines and punches and open hand slaps but. I, want, I want to touch on what he said too like for us um, experience for me experience is the best teacher and I think for me and Matt, we've been those, we've been through so much stuff in our life that we basically made learned how to make love to pressure, and enjoy the good and the bad times the same. So a, a loss, yes, yeah, it's, it's a part of life, and you and you go through things and you try to figure out what's the good side of it, but it's all the only good side of it is going through it, because it's only you it can't get worse. You know what I mean? So everything we've been through in life, I think we dealt with it with our head up, chest out, knowing that we gonna get through it. But do you realize how much stronger that makes you yeah. than me? No, oh. stronger, stronger than me? No, oh. the specifics of what it is that you did. Now there are different kinds of strengths, right? right? Like I would, I would say to you that I'm getting stronger around my brother's grief, although I am not, I am not yet strong. But the, that attitude that you're talking about makes you guys much stronger than the average human being because the, the, the days have so much failure in them they have these guys depend on us and we know that you know what i'm saying we got people that depend on us so i'm just talking about your basketball it. careers though yeah. now you're inventing yourself in the second space mm -hmm. right now you're going to apply whatever competitiveness exists anywhere and you you quit a good you're leaving a good job that if you wanted to take the traditional path you could be a color commentator as and king's icon mm -hmm. matt barnes you don't want to take the traditional path you're the, the, the strength that you guys have makes you go chase the difficult things because the rewards are on yeah. the side of the most difficult things well, on I'll the other side. I'll share a quick story about, you know, when we sat down with Kobe 
um, our last interview and before we were in his office talking, and he was so adamant about, you know, this last 20 years of me being a Laker and COVID. Like, I don't want people to remember me by that. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, you're a five-time champ, one of the greatest players ever. He's like, no, they, like these next 20, this business side is what I want people to remember me for. And, and he's just like, you know, as athletes, we're disciplined, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're coachable, we listen, we apply ourselves, and, and we have to be elite. You know, he's like, I'm taking all that to the business space. And I know there was a lot of people just with that alone, I'm going to surpass. Oh, he was going to get there before LeBron oh, and Tom no Brady. They're all competing in that space yeah. now for the ownership. Yeah. They're all yeah. there. This is how you get into the halls of power, yeah. though, right? Because yeah. now Tom Brady is choosing between a three hundred seventy five million dollar job and owning the Raiders. LeBron, I think LeBron showed all these guys what could be possible here. But of course, now Dwayne owns part of the Utah Jazz, because here comes real power. Here comes real change. Michael Jordan, the only black owner in basketball, gets out with all of the money, had very little in the way of impact. But here come his descendants, as competitive as him, and learning the things that a new generation learns with more power in this space. Like, that you're going... May one day you be making the deals with LeBron at the top just because you have the relationships, because because there's plenty of money here for everybody once you guys have the power and get into this game and start like disrupting, mm -hmm. disrupting mm -hmm. it. I love just, I'm obviously gonna say the number, but I love when he said last night, he's like the money you're getting this year is just the beginning. I was just like, oh, I love to hear that. But anyway, this is uh man, this has been great. We got quick hitters now. Uh, first thing to come to mind, let us know, what is your top five <clears throat> Miami athletes of all time? Okay, that is putting me on the spot. In mm -hmm. no particular order, we're not going in any particular order. Okay, Let's I'm going to go. make that clear. <laughs> uh, no, I'm going to do it in order. I'm going to go number five, Jose Fernandez. I'm going to say that because he, uh, he told a particularly Cuban tale. El I put, Duque? Uh, no, there are three. There are three okay. Cuban guys. He... Uh, Jose Fernandez uh, is uh, the, the Latin player who passed away, but he, he's the, probably the biggest arm in history. But you got the two brothers you were mentioning, Levon and El Duque. I'd put all three of them together just because of the emotion of they told my, uh, my family's story. They came over from Cuba. Um, uh, four, I would go Alonzo Mourning um, because of, uh, he, he helped Overtown in a way. Uh, he had real impact charitably in our community, caring about people that not a lot of people cared about and was obviously a Hall of Famer and great. Uh, three would be uh, uh, Dan Marino, because uh, he built a children's, child, that should probably be number two, because uh, he built a children's hospital and was a Hall of Famer. Uh, and played in Ace Ventura. Played, played in Ace Ventura. Uh, <laughs> I am. Uh, I got to think about this for a second. I'm going to go number three, Ricky Williams, because his story is uh, I, he's friends. Uh, we're friends and I love him. I love him like a brother. And he was great. And he was wronged. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. got chased out of the league for smoking weed. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's crazy. Uh, and then number one would be Dwayne Wade. He's the best uh, best athlete in the history of our mm -hmm. town. Love it. One thing you wish you were better at. Uh, forgiving myself. Oh, that's deep. B being less hard on myself. That's why I go to therapy. I'm trying. I've, I've had a lot of trouble with that one. If I could be more gentle with myself, I would be more loving and uh, kinder to myself. You'll get there. Uh, one dream interview that you haven't had yet that you would like to get. Oh, man. Uh, one dream interview. Uh, oof. I'm going to go Jim Carrey. I'm going to say Jim Carrey. Good call. Uh, let me tell you something. I like that. <laughs> Top five sports personalities of all time. Oh, dear God. Um, woo, sports personalities of all time. Uh, give me some nominations here, right? Because we're going to go. Ali. Howard Cosell yeah. is obvious. Oh, sports personalities. You're not talking about broadcaster no, types. You're talking yeah. about, okay, you're talking about characters. Mm -hmm. You're talking about uh, charisma. And, um, yeah, of course, okay, uh, Ali uh J jim brown although complicated legacy um yeah, 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 yeah so but i mean you're talking about civil rights activist uh bad relationship with women that that causes a moral conundrum that uh but as a person i mean retires from the league at the age of 30 as mvp from the set of the dirty dozen because he doesn't like his pay and wouldn't go to jail 
uh, because he wasn't, or I'm sorry, wouldn't pick up trash and preferred to go to jail because he wasn't going to be undignified as a black man in his position picking up trash. Uh, so all of these guys who, who had activist causes are moving to me. Um, personalities, personalities. Rodman, mm. uh, going all basketball here, football, rub some of that out. Uh, Dion? Is he yeah, I know. Well, D thank you. Thank you for the help. Dion, uh, because he taught. Dion knew all of this stuff much earlier, mm -hmm. how to how to manage his brand, how to be a master yes. marketer, how to be somebody who, um, who who paved the way on both commerce and funny and, and knew how to sell himself. That's enough. You guys are wearing me out. This is like, <laughs> I, 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 I don't like, I, like, I don't. That's it. You're making me think too much. I, I grieved. I, I wept. Come on. Said, this is, a, is, a, is emotional roller coaster. That I called the hip hop duet. Yeah, like, yeah. come on, man. You're wearing me out. Hey, what? Wh 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 Welcome to Death Row. Stuck on an island. Oh, Three shows or God. movies in rotation. Come on, man. How many more of these are there? I can't <laughs> hear you. You guys have more stamina. Come you on, have more man. stamina than I do. Three favorite shows or movies. Okay, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go. Uh, uh, Breaking Bad. Uh, uh, the 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 Sopranos. Um, uh, and the Jeffersons. Nice. Ooh, that's a nice three. I ain't heard no one say that's the Jeffersons. Nice I like that. That's so old. What's your guilty pleasure? Cheesecake. Cheesecake. Yeah, that was easy. Right. That was quick. Huh? You didn't have to think about that one. Yeah. 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 You're think thinking about, about something right now. <laughs> Cheesecake. <laughs> well, if you want to ask me about food, I'm happy to go on for another three hours. I'm with you on that. Uh, five dinner guests, dead or alive. You plus five around a dinner table talking about whatever. You know what? I can't. I can't do this. It's a pleasure working with you guys. I'm looking forward to the partnership. Yeah. <laughs> Let me be my partner. Walk out of the hey, I love it. Hey, guys. only, <laughs> only, <laughs> only <laughs> here. <laughs> hey, man, that's a wrap. Dan Levitar, we're thankful. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, John Skipper. Thank you, Metal Lark, for believing in us. Uh, DraftKings, this new. This new era of All The Smoke Productions is going to be great. Thank you guys for sticking by us and being loyal fans. Me and Jack got a lot of new shit coming your way. Catch us. Can walk off, he can walk off. Yeah, that's Dan. Come on, man. That's Dan. I just, I just hope when he hugged me, he didn't mess my hair up, goddammit. You can't mess that shit up. You can catch All The Smoke Productions. YouTube. Find this interview on Vinnie Moore. We'll see you guys next week.